Son and the Holy Spirit. Good evening. My name is Father Michael Marcantoni. I am a priest here at the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Detroit. I want to thank you for tuning in once again to our channel. So, uh, over the last series of videos that we did, uh, the most popular by far was the video on the liturgy. And that got me to thinking that whether we are longtime members of the church, lifetime members of the church, or newcomers to Holy Orthodoxy, probably the thing that most people have the most questions about are the mysteria, the mysteries. Now, mysteries is the word that we use properly when speaking about the ceremonial life of the Orthodox Church, the liturgical life of the Orthodox Church. Technically, we don't use the word sacrament. We use the word mystery. Now, mysterion doesn't mean, mystery or mysterion, doesn't mean something that we don't understand. As a theological term, that's not what it is. It's kind of like the way that the word theory in scientific jargon doesn't mean the same thing as theory in everyday speech. In everyday speech, when we talk and we say something is a theory, it's a guess, and one guess is just as good as another. But in scientific terms, when we speak of a theory in, sci in the empirical sciences, the scientist means that something is as, a theory for the scientist is as close to being proved as possible without becoming a absolute proven fact. So it carries a lot more weight in the scientific world when you say theory. That means it's as close to proved as we can get until it's proved. Whereas in everyday speech, it means just one guess or another's guess, someone's opinion. There's a big difference. And so when we say mystery in everyday speech, we think something that we don't get, something that's kind of hard to grasp. In theology, in Christian language, in holy orthodoxy, when we say the mysteries, the mysteria, it doesn't mean something that we don't understand. A mystery is the experience of God. It is something that we can be initiated into. It can be experienced, but it cannot be well expressed. And so we can't speak of it well, and that's why, unless absolutely necessary, the uh, in the various mysteria, like baptism, wedding, ordination, so forth, the one entering into the mystery versus sacrament, the one entering into it, doesn't say a whole lot. In fact, they usually don't say anything at all. And some of them, absolutely nothing at all. Because it's something that can be experienced, but not expressed. And in the presence of mystery, in the presence of awe, silence is the proper language. And that opens us up to fully expressing this thing that we are confronted with. I'm, uh, I am reminded of uh, Carl Sagan's, one of his uh, great movies, gosh, one of his great works on outer space that got turned into a movie back in the late 90s, and I am blanking, I think it was Contact. And in it, the protagonist was asked how she could prove that she loved her father. And she realized that she really couldn't prove it, because you could say you love your father, you could be lying. You could set net you could rattle off all the things that you've done and the things that you've said towards them and the conversations you've had but it could all be an act truth be told there was no way to prove that love existed that couldn't be called into doubt or question that couldn't be met with a skeptic's gaze it had to be taken on faith and that faith had to be grounded in the experience. And she could say that she and her father loved one another because they experienced that love. And therefore, the words and the actions that went with it ratified it. That is the way the mysteries work in the Orthodox Church. And so when we come to baptism, when we come to the wedding, when we come to holy unction, apart from the absolute necessities, the one undergoing it says nothing because we are there to experience the presence and love of God. So, I want, and in that experiencing, we can 
we can live it, we can experience it. The idea being that we then embody it and take it out to the world and call others to experience the same thing as well. But it is ultimately, the presence of God is ultimately ineffable. And anything we say about it will be but a pale shadow. But we can bring them to the Christ who they can experience themselves. Now, with that said, I want to go ahead and begin this series on the Mysteria, this series on the mysteries of the church. And we're going to go ahead and look at them. And we're going to go ahead and discuss them because these are the things that even people who are tangentially attached to the church end up coming back around for. People come for baptisms. People come for weddings. During Holy Week, people come from Holy Unction. People show up for funerals who you may not see the rest of the year. And if we don't understand what's going on, that's a missed opportunity. They are also some of the most beautiful services in the church and a great fountain of understanding. I can tell you online that uh, I can tell you online that one of the major questions is what is the orthodox church's position on this? Or what is the orthodox church's position on that? Why does or why doesn't the Orthodox Church believe or agree with such and such a thing? If we want to know what the Orthodox Church believes and thinks, what the faith of Jesus Christ is handed down to us from the Apostles says about any given topic, look to the mysteries, look to the services for that thing. You want to know what the Orthodox Church believes is the purpose of marriage? Go read the service on marriage. Yes, you will still have some things to ask your priest about, but you're going to know 95% of what there is to know. You want to know what we think baptism does? Read the baptismal service. Holy unction, what's it for? Read it. All of these things are available online for free, but to make it a little bit easier, we're going to begin to talk about them here one by one by one. So I want to go ahead and close off this video by talking a little bit about marriage because that is one of that is the mystery that one has comes into the public eye the most because there's all it's also the only mystery where there is also a corresponding legal civil component when we get baptized there's no civic parallel for baptism you don't get a civic baptism and a church baptism. It doesn't happen. Funeral. As far as the state's concerned, you could have one or not. There's not a civic funeral per se. You can just get lowered into the ground. Marriage. The Orthodox Church believes very concrete things about it, practices it in a very particular way, and yet there is also the civic component of going and getting a license. They're using the same language that we use. We do not mean the same thing. So what I'm going to say now is just sort of a teaser of some of the things that we'll be getting into, and it's certainly not all there is to know about the Orthodox service of holy matrimony. But let's go ahead and say a few things about it. You may have noticed if you've been to an Orthodox wedding, and many of you have, it's no secret that in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, 90% of our own people get married to non-Orthodox Christians. So that means that almost all of the people who are in our communities who are not Orthodox Christians but are married to Orthodox Christians, have undergone an Orthodox ceremony that they, in some cases, know fairly little about. But if you've been to one of these ceremonies, if you've been to an Orthodox wedding, you know that the couple doesn't say a word. There are no vows exchanged. Nothing is said. They are betrothed at the service. They are crowned at the service. They are proclaimed married at the service. The gospel is preached to them, but they say nothing. Now, that flies in the face of the way we think about marriage in our society today. 
In the secular world, we think of marriage first and foremost as a benevolent contract of love, of romantic love specifically, between two individuals. But within the Orthodox Church, when we look at marriage, marriage is first and foremost as read in the epistle, the only epistle read at marriage, the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, is a great mysterion, a great mystery, and that mystery is Christ and his church. It is a great image and icon of Christ and his church, how God incarnate relates to his bride, the church. And Paul goes on to say that he relates to his bride like this, sets his own dignity aside, He's falsely accused and arrested. He bleeds out for her to give her life because she's worth it. Rises from the dead to bring her to where he is. You see, where civic marriage puts front and center romantic love, orthodox marriage puts front and center the unconditional love of service. Now, there is surely a romantic component, but first and foremost, we are choosing to give love to this person, when, not because they deserve it. When we don't feel like it, we, we are sick of one another and we're tired because they deserve it. When Christ comes to his bride, the church, and calls her from among the nations, she doesn't deserve it. She's done nothing to earn it. Many of the people called will not reciprocate, but he does it anyway, because he can, and because she's worth it. And so he spares no expense in sacrificing for her, laying down even his own life. That self-sacrificial love is the cornerstone of what an Orthodox marriage is built on, and, what it, and the way that it reflects the relationship between Christ and his church. This is also why we don't say anything, why we don't have vows. Because that is a mystery. That is something we can experience but not express very well. Marriage for the Orthodox Christian, therefore, is not a contract. It's not a piece of paper. It's not a legal agreement. It is a commitment to self-sacrifice and love. And there's no terms and conditions for that. And there's no bottom line to set your name on. Which means redefining it according to the politics and whims of the day is simply out of question. Because it wasn't man who defined it in the first place. According to Jesus Christ, when he speaks in the Sermon on the Mount about marriage, he says that it was instituted by God, namely for this purpose that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two should become one flesh. And then that is finished being talked about in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, saying that I speak to you, husbands, I speak to you of a great mystery, and I mean Christ and his church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself for her, and let the wife see that she respects the husband. According to Jesus Christ, according to the Scriptures, according to St. Paul, Marriage is not a social arrangement. It is a divine institution. And it is a divine institution meant to reflect the kingdom of God visibly present on earth. We should admit that we rarely see it work out that way. But we have to also admit that our failure to do so does not change one iota of that purpose or that potential. And so when we enter into a Christian marriage, when we enter into an Orthodox marriage, that is the perspective from which we enter on. It is not a contract. It is a commitment of completely undeserved love. And because it is not a contract, there's no terms, there's no vows. There's nothing to break because it is a commitment of your life. And that mystery is something that can be experienced, but not well expressed.
That is the heart of mystery. That is the essence of what we're going to be exploring. So in this upcoming series of videos, we're going to go ahead and talk about the mysteria, the mysteries of the church, these great and holy things meant to bring us into direct contact with God and sanctify all of our lives in Jesus Christ. And yes, we will still cover marriage because there's a lot more to say, but I will see you for the next video on holy baptism. And we'll start by looking at the very beginning of the Christian life and why we don't really use the word sacrament because it does tie into what happens at a baptism to begin with. Stay tuned. I will see you then. May the Holy Trinity bless and protect you always. Amen.